Send forth your light and truth. Let them guide me and bring me safely to the place you dwell. Amen. Friends, over the last 10 years, the sport of archery has seen this massive influx of excited participants. Now, experts say the reason why that is is because of the, the Hunger Games movie that came out within the last 10 years. Um, all joking aside, though, do, do you know what country ranks number one in archery? You might be thinking England because of the fictional character Robin of Roxley and his band of merry thieves in Robin Hood. Or perhaps you're thinking of Scotland with this red curly-haired heroine named Merida from Disney's Brave. However, it's actually the United States. A gentleman by the name of Bradley Ellison will be competing in the next Olympic Games for the gold medal against the South Korean champion, Im Dong Yoon. Now, that in and of itself is fairly impressive. However, it's not as impressive as the South Korean champion. In order to be a, a talented archer, someone has to have a few things going for them. They have to be patient. They have to have determination and, and dedication and drive and focus, and some natural skill doesn't hurt either. But there's one other thing that a good archer needs to have to be successful. What do you think that is? Yeah. Sight. <laughs> Sounds pretty obvious, right? If you want to be able to hit the target, you should be able to see the target. Um, it's hard enough being able to strike a bullseye with 20-20 vision in each eye, but it doesn't really seem like that's possible if you can't actually see the target. And yet that's what makes South Korean champion Im Dong Yoon so impressive. Because he's legally blind. Which means that when he actually hits the target and when he gets the bullseye, which seems is more often than not, it's an extraordinary feat. Archeries, or archers need to be able to, to tune out their surroundings, to, to quiet their minds, to focus in on the target, and to strike with pinpoint precision. And not just do it like, like once, but do it again and again and again. But then you take that on top of this idea that an Olympic champion is to represent his nation. That he alone is responsible for the glory and prestige that his people are so wanting. That's some outstanding pressure on an individual. It's something that you and I can relate to a little bit as Christians. To have the eyes of many that we are representing watch over us. To stand before a target and take aim with the pressure of missing. And in order for there to be success, we have to keep our eyes open. Now, the Apostle Paul had a clear vision. He said, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection in order to take hold of the very thing that Christ provided when Jesus took hold of him. That's the state of perfect righteousness. Paul wanted to exist in this reality where when he took the line and aimed at the target, he would never miss. That he would score a bullseye every single time. And to that end, Paul writes to the Philippian believers, and he says to them, join others in following my example. Now his point wasn't, look up to me because I have it all figured out, and I'm successful. He knew from past mistakes that that was a, a frivolous attempt. Paul desired the believers in Philippi to instead mimic his attitude, to long for the goal that all people who believe in Jesus long for, this remodeling of who we are, a reforming of our identity, not just a declaration, but physically, by being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ, standing in imperishability and immortality. That meant more 
than just having a transformed body that gives us finally those six-pack abs. That means more than, than having low blood pressure and a clean bill of health. The resurrection from the dead that transforms the body is one that reflects a living heart, a renewed mind, and an active faith that Jesus has already given both Paul and, and the Philippians and, and also us. Now when it comes to, to the resurrection of the dead, where, where the dead will literally get up and walk and move and talk and think and breathe, the world thinks that we're idiots. They think it's a ridiculous notion, and they don't have a monopoly on that viewpoint. Because the ancient Roman and Greek world felt the same. Except there was one difference in the ancient world. The reason why they thought a resurrection from the dead was ridiculous was because they viewed that everything physical, everything in this world, everything that is fleshly and bodily is completely ridden with corruption and wickedness and evil. And so those who died, why would they ever want to return to that? And yet despite that information, it didn't stop them from catering and involving themselves in those type of sins. It didn't prevent those who stood up as believers in God from mimicking all the wrong people. Now friends, we can honestly say that, that life is a complicated thing, and I think if, if we're going to be honest with ourselves, I think all of us would probably like to go back a few years when we were younger and remember the older, the old, simpler days of our youth, where we, we gathered with our friends and played games where we didn't have to worry about all the things that we, we encountered. And chances are, one of those games that, that you may have played is, is called Tug of War. Do you remember that game? I don't know if you played it, I certainly did, but, but it involves two opposing sides that grab a hold of this rope and attempt to yank the other team across the threshold and possibly into a giant puddle of mud. Now, as believers of God, we, we look at that and say, wow, that pretty much sums up my entire life. Because our lives are filled with all kinds of struggle. We're oftentimes, we're not just feeling like we're being pulled in one direction or another, but we feel like we are being pushed in one direction or another. <clears throat> Philippi was, was a Roman colony that dwelled within the area of Macedonia, where Alexander the Great was from. It was in a great nation. They were surrounded by, by all manner of of idolatry. From, from the worship of cast idols made of clay or, or stone or silver or bronze or gold, all the way up to worshiping the flesh with actions of debauchery and drunkenness and sexual immorality. Paul's concern for his children in the faith was that they would be infected by the things of this world. That it would cause them to, to leave the truth and return to where they had been called from. And he wasn't just being paranoid because, in fact, that had already taken place. He said, many are living as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomachs. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Friends, does that sound like anybody that you know? Are there toxic individuals in your life? I don't simply mean the abrasive, stubborn, and repulsive people of the unbelieving world in which you encounter as you go about within it. But I mean fellow co-workers or, or long-life friends that maybe you went to school with or, or family members that you may be close to or distant or even people that you know who stand up and confess to believe in God, and yet are some of the most venomous people that you can encounter. The struggle for you and me and every Christian is 
to be in the world, but not of the world. But our job is not to judge the hearts of others. However, Jesus did say, by their fruit, you will know them. So in order for us to, to see the, the dangerous fruits that people produce, we have to keep our eyes open. Paul's primary concern for you and me is, is not that we, would, that we would face all kinds of struggles and temptations in this world like we looked at last week with Jesus in the wilderness. His concern was that you and I would fail. That you and I would stand before that target and unlatch and release an arrow and miss. That we would cave to those temptations. Not just once or twice or even ten times, but repeatedly, so that it stopped being a temptation and became a habit. And the result is, is that it no longer served as a struggle because we already incorporated it into our lives as a lifestyle and a choice. A choice to turn to a life that the world proclaims to turn to a life that Jesus came into this world to rescue us from. Freedom through grace does not mean freedom to sin. It doesn't mean that we can fill our houses with all useless junk because we can't take it with us so we might as well enjoy it while we got it. It doesn't mean be filled with all kinds of bitterness and malice and disagreement with one another and then blame it on, I had a bad day or I didn't get enough sleep. And it certainly doesn't mean that we can mimic the natural tongue of the devil and use half-truths and lies and deceits to manipulate people and situations to get us out of trouble. When Paul says, take note, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ, his admonition isn't for me to look for genuine faith, nor is it for you to identify the hypocrites. Nor is it for us to, to withdraw from the world, because how else will they ever hear about the resurrection that Christ proclaims? We are to keep our eyes open. Because the reality is, is that the deadly philosophies of this world permeate our subconsciousness and whisper lies into our ears like, hey man, if it feels good, just go with it. Just do it. What's wrong with a little rebellion? No one's going to really know. And people fall to that flawed Epicurean view of eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow you die because for them, they don't know there's something after tomorrow. And the struggle for us is, is that we do. We know it. And yet from time to time, those temptations cause us to drop the rope, to stop struggling against it, and maybe even to walk to the other side as we kick up the mud in our own faces. Paul says, keep your eyes open. Keep them open so that you and I can recognize the pitfalls that others who have come before us have fallen into, so that we don't make the same mistakes and get trapped in the same situations. But also, so that we can see and mimic an even greater, nobler character in the life of our Savior Jesus. Christ's foundation, Christ is the foundation of the Apostle Paul. And what Paul awaited to take hold of is the desire of everyone's life, a future that's unrecognizable from our current surrounding, that's untainted by our fallen world. Not, that's, not things that are contaminated by the old sinful flesh, but controlled and guided by the spirit that Jesus has filled us with. Not manipulated by, by the cravings of this world, but by the many graces that God rains down on you and me on a daily basis. 
Brothers and sisters, the fact is, is that why does life have to be so hard? Because you're struggling. And if you stop struggling, one of two things has happened. You're either at home in glory because you're no longer here. Or you cave and gave up. And yet, the conflict that exists is a constant reminder that we don't have to be tempted to drop that rope. We don't have to be tempted to walk to the other side because as we stand there facing that other team, we're not alone. That there are our brothers and sisters in the faith that are right beside us in the trenches grabbing a hold of that same rope so that we can bear each other up in love and faithfulness and truth. And we can look behind us and see that the anchor that's keeping us planted is Jesus. And what causes us to stand firm is the hope that he fills us with. Christ is holding you and me steady. He's yanking us back to the safety of, of his home and, and his care. He who, who ripped you from the other team who, who washed the mud from your face, who, who planted you on his side, will, will never let you be taken away. As you stand before that target with a bow in hand, an arrow cocked, and the wind of temptation slapping you in the face, and the voices of hostility shouting in your ears, and the, the doubts and weariness arising within your hearts, that Jesus opens your eyes. He causes you to see. To not see the, the failed attempts at the number of shots that we've tried to make and miss, but to see the target that is right before us and the bullseye that he has obliterated for you and me. Like Paul, we, we keep our eyes open on Jesus who saved us from death by suffering its sting on that bloody cross for you and me. He has set us free from destruction by the tomb that he passed through. He wasn't the first to rise from the dead, but he's the only one that has the, the power and authority to lift up his life again. And he may be the first to rise in imperishability and splendor and glory, but he won't be the last. That destination awaits you. By the decree of his lips, we live and we move and we have our being. By the power of his word, his voice raised us from the slumber of unbelief. By his command, sin has, has lost its grip on our hearts. And by his promise, we await a transformation. Where our bodies will will be made like his. Where our thoughts and our wills and our attitudes will be made captive to his word. And where this earthly journey will come to an end as we arrive in the place that he allows us to call home. Friends, we stand firm, keeping our eyes open. Not at all the failures that are all around us, but to the sky as we await the Savior of our souls, the Redeemer of our lives, the one who is coming with salvation on his lips and freedom in his hands. So stand and keep watch because your Savior is coming. Amen. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding guards your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.